AWS Lambda is the most popular serverless compute platform out there. But what can we actually do with this thing? How are people using Lambda to solve their real life production problems? Hello everyone, I'm Daniel and in this video we are going to be talking about my top 5 most popular use cases for AWS Lambda. A word of warning here, much of this is going to be opinionated based on my professional experience using AWS and Lambda for the past 5 years or so. I will tell you though that these 5 patterns are by far the most popular ones that I've seen in real life building production applications. So let's begin by counting down from number five. All right, everyone, so here we are, and I wanna start with one of the most popular patterns, which is number five, and that is API gateway integration. So many of us build our Lambda functions and they interact with other AWS services, such as Amazon S3 or something like DynamoDB. But what happens if we want to expose the functionality that our Lambda function provides to other applications, such as maybe a mobile application or maybe a web application that wants to call this Lambda function? In order to do that normally, we would have to expose credentials to access that Lambda function, which is a big no-no from a security perspective. So in order to expose our Lambda function to the outside world, we can put in front of it an API Gateway endpoint. Now, API Gateway is a service provided by AWS, which provides a whole bunch of functionalities, and its main use case is to allow you to build HTTP or REST endpoints. So using the combination of API Gateway and Lambda, we can wire these two things together, and when we do, we get a RESTful endpoint, which is a URL that can be accessed that will in turn invoke our Lambda functions behind the scenes. So in terms of how this looks from a real life practical perspective, we go ahead and we configure these two things such that the API gateway is wired to our Lambda function. And then we get that public URL, which we can vend out to our application owners, which can call our API gateway. And they just submit a HTTP request to our API gateway and that forwards all the way to our Lambda function. Our Lambda function does what it needs to do and returns a response all the way back to the caller. Now keep in mind, there's a whole bunch of other benefits to using API gateways such as rate limiting. Uh, so you can rate limit specific clients clients if you only want them to call at a particular throughput. There's also security options that you can lock down your API gateway endpoint. By default, it does not come with this, so anyone with the URL can invoke your endpoint. Uh, however, you can integrate this with uh, either a, another Lambda function, which is an authorizer, or a Cognito user pool, which can be used to authenticate users prior to letting the request all the way through to our Lambda function. And I have two videos on that that I'll put down in the comment section below. So that's number five. It is API gateway integration with lambdas, which are very, very popular. I highly suggest you learn this because you'll see this time and time again when working with AWS. All right, so let's move on to number four now, which is serverless cron jobs. So I'm sure you're familiar with cron jobs. They allow us to schedule regularly occurring uh, events that you know, trigger some kind of function that we want to do on some interval. This can be daily, this can be hourly, this can be every minute or second. Uh, the cadence is really up to you. Now, in the past, you usually had to set this up on a particular server, which would wake up at the predefined moment and perform its process. But this gets a whole lot easier using our Lambda functions now. We can integrate with a service called CloudWatch. Uh, now, CloudWatch typically is used for monitoring and alarms and a whole bunch of other uh, services that it provides as well. It does have one subservice, which is called CloudWatch Events, and you can set up a time-based event such that on a regular occurring interval, uh, you can invoke your Lambda function and the syntax of setting this up is very very similar to what you would see for a normal cron job so you get to specify the day month hour all of those things and you can also specify an input whether that be dynamic or static so that it can be passed into your lambda function as arguments a very common reason people use this is to perform nightly database maintenance or maybe wake up every hour or so to say update a dashboard or something like that very very common you see this all over the place you should know how to set it up and how to do it. All right, so moving on to number three, and that is event processing with SNS and SQS. So event processing is just a fancy way of saying that we get notified asynchronously when something changes and we want to respond or react to that event. Maybe we want to do some processing ourselves. Maybe you want to tell someone else about that event or do something else with the content. It's really up to you. Regardless of why you're doing it, it's a very common pattern in AWS, and we can incorporate this with Lambda functions. 
So let's start with SNS first, which stands for Simple Notification Service. So this is a, if you never heard of it before, this is a pub sub service. Uh, you have two parties really. Um, there's a publisher and a subscriber. In this case, our Lambda would be the subscriber. So whenever a message gets published to our SNS topic, it will automatically invoke our Lambda function. So usually you have a pattern like this where the topic owner would publish an event and using this integration between SNS and Lambda, uh, you can automatically trigger that Lambda function in response to any change. Say for example, if you had like a credit card transaction topic, so this SNS topic here was for credit card transactions. So this publisher may be another application. So whenever a transaction occurs, uh, it publishes you know, a transaction uh, to this topic that'll automatically invoke our Lambda function with the corresponding payload and our Lambda function can uh, perform some kind of business logic there. Now that was a very common pattern for a long time. In fact, it was the only option for asynchronous event processing with Lambda functions. However, things have changed and the more modern way of doing this is using SQS, which stands for Simple Queue Service. Now where SNS was fan out in the sense that you can have one topic which fans out to many other Lambda functions. So say for example, this SNS can deliver to this Lambda function. We can have another one here, another one here, and it would just invoke all of them whenever a message gets gets uh, published, um, a straight copy of that message gets published to all. With SQS, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So in this case, whenever a message gets on queue to our SQS topic, our Lambda function will pull that message. So in fact, this arrow should probably be in reverse, uh, but Lambda function will periodically pull SQS to see if there's any messages that are available to it. And it'll invoke that Lambda function passing in input, which is equal to whatever the contents are of your SQS message. So how this would typically work is that someone would come along and on queue a message, it gets added to your queue. So it just sits there for a while until your Lambda function picks it up. But this usually happens very, very quickly, by the way, there's usually almost zero delay. So like I mentioned, uh, no one really uses SNS to Lambda anymore, except in some uh, exceptional circumstances. A much more common pattern is this. Uh, so we take away the SNS to Lambda and we don't on queue to SQS directly. Instead, what happens is we put an arrow in here. So in this pattern, someone publishes to our SNS topic. And remember, SNS is fan out. So we can have many different subscribers here. And then we set up so that our SNS delivers a message to our queue and then Lambda function will pull that message from that queue and process that message and do whatever it needs to do. Again, this is the most common pattern that you'll see. And this is by far the most common way of doing things in terms of uh, providing messages to your Lambda function via SQS. All right, so let's move on to number two now. And number two is file upload processing with Amazon S3. This is one of my favorite capabilities of using Lambda and S3 because it allows you to do some very interesting things. And I'll just throw an example at you here, but the possibilities really are endless. So again, assume we have our Lambda function here and we want to leverage Amazon S3. S3 is an object store. You can use it to store image files, text files, blobs, massive files, small files, whatever you really want here. Now say we have an application that is interested in uh, uploading images. Maybe we have a web app that wants to allow our users to upload an image of themselves and maybe do some machine learning on the image, facial recognition, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we set it up so that our web app allows users to upload files into S3. Now upon an image being uploaded to S3, we need to kind of react to it. We need to, you know, process that image, perform something, and then maybe spit out a report back to the client so that they can see what the result of that uh, facial recognition in this case was. So what we can do with AWS Lambda and S3 is that we can create a upload trigger so that whenever a upload occurs, to our S3 bucket, we can automatically invoke our Lambda function. And as an input to our Lambda function will be the name of the file that was just uploaded. So we can go back to S3 from our Lambda function code and say, go and grab that actual file, which was in this case an image, and then maybe pass this off to something like SageMaker to perform some machine learning. Maybe we have something locally, we're using a different library, we don't need to go to any other external uh, service, but this can be leveraged to react to events that occur in 
in our S3 bucket. And it's very, very convenient because you don't need to have any kind of REST API sitting in front of this in order to make this happen. It all just happens directly between these two services. So this is just one example of how this is useful, but there's a whole bunch of other ways in which S3 triggers can be used. Um, you can use it for data processing where you have a whole bunch of data that's arriving in S3 and you want to process it. Um, you can use it in combinations with a service called Kinesis Firehose so that Firehose will batch your data into larger files. And then upon upload, you can trigger a Lambda function. Have a whole bunch of videos on this and there's a whole bunch more to this. Uh, so I do suggest you learn about this and get comfortable with applying it in your day-to-day -day work. All right, so my final topic or my number one here is glue logic for step function workflows. Uh, so step functions are kind of a new kid on the block. Their predecessor was a service called uh, Simple Workflow Service, which stands for SWF. And they allow you to do things like um, build workflows. So let me just start with an example here to explain how this might work. So say for instance, we're building a step function workflow that's gonna be responsible for processing credit card transactions. So we may build a Lambda function called Credit Card Validator. And the input pass to this Credit Card Validator function um, or this, this step function function which, where the first step is the credit card validator may just be the credit card number, the PIN number, and the transaction amount. That's the arguments that's given to us as part of the beginning of our step function workflow. So we can code up this Lambda function to call some other external service. Maybe we have something that exists called the PIN validation service. We provide it with some arguments and it just tells us, hey, is this credit card number and PIN combination valid? There's two possibilities here. It either is valid uh, or it is not valid. So let's go with the latter case first. So let's assume that there was a failure here. So if there's a failure, we basically stop. Our step function workflow is done. We can't proceed because the transaction was invalid. So we automatically go to a done state. Uh, but what happens if it was successful? Then we need to do something different. We need to actually charge the credit card for the value that was provided in the input arguments. So we can have a second Lambda function, and this can be called the transaction executor function. And this is only reached whenever there's a success. So when the pin validation service from our previous function returns a 200 OK, that this was a valid authorization for this charge, in the success branch will go to the transaction executor. Now the transaction executor can do things like go and call the Visa or MasterCard service to actually try and charge the customer with the value. Now, regardless of whether or not that succeeds or fails, we may choose to go into the done state and therefore our step function workflow is over. Um, so this is just a very simple and contrived example, but it gives you an idea of what you can do with Lambda functions in combination with step functions. You can do all sorts of branching logic, add retries, uh, exception handling. You can also integrate with other services like SNS, like DynamoDB, like AWS Glue. There's a whole bunch of different options here to build some very rich and complicated workflows uh, depending on what you're trying to do with your use case. So if you want to learn how to build any of these patterns, I'm going to put a playlist here on the right that you can watch, which has step-by-step -step video tutorials on how to build each of these top five patterns. So I hope you enjoy that and thanks so much.